Hello and welcome to Freedom Watch, your daily dose of raw liberty online at foxnews.com slash freedom watch. I'm Judge Andrew Napolitano here defending freedom, defending your natural rights, and defending your right to have a government that stays within the confines of the Constitution. National health care is now the law of the land, and it raises a fundamental question. Can the federal government compel any person to have health insurance? Congress will claim that the answer is yes, because Congress may regulate interstate commerce pursuant to power granted to it in the Constitution. But the original grant of this power meant that Congress should keep commerce regular. That is, it should assure that the states don't interfere with commerce by imposing tariffs on the movement of out-of-state goods into the states. But over the years, Congress has pushed the envelope and regulated more than just commerce. It has regulated the salaries and working conditions and the costs of the goods of those who manufacture what moves in interstate commerce. The courts as well over the years have gone along with this. But the Congress has never compelled individuals to engage in interstate commerce by forcing them to purchase something. My view is that this is clearly unconstitutional, as well beyond the power given to the Congress in the Constitution. Joining me now is one of America's great defenders of freedom and liberty today and the author of the bestseller, End the Fed. Congressman Ron Paul joins us from Capitol Hill. Congressman, welcome back to Freedom Watch. Thank you, Judge. Did anybody take seriously before all the drama over last weekend whether or not Congress even has the power to do most of what is in that 2,700-page bill that the House passed by five votes? No, they don't take it seriously. Matter of fact, uh, they do believe that they are obeying the Constitution because you hear them on the TV all the time that the Interstate Commerce Clause gives them this uh, uh, right to do it. And they also say the General Welfare Clause justifies everything that they've done. So, uh, no, they don't lose any sleep over this, and uh, the point that you make about forcing them to buy something is obviously very unconstitutional. There will be a lot of legislation introduced uh, dealing with this, and uh, hopefully it will get into the courts and clean it up. But in the meantime, I'm going to introduce one piece of legislation which will be very narrow, and it will be directing toward this mandate of forcing you to buy something. I think I can do that in less than one page, and I think that's the kind of bill that people understand. So I will be introducing legislation to repeal that provision. If, if your legislation is not passed, and if this legislation that the president signed yesterday stays as the law of the land, what do you think is the long-term financial impact on this country, which is already broke, which is already trillions in debt? Well, it just means a lot more bankruptcy. It means health care is going to be a lot worse. I mean, you know, take the whole idea that you can force somebody uh, to give insurance to somebody even until they're 26. Uh, why isn't that an agreement between the customer and, and the insurance company? So this will be very costly. And uh, where are they going to get the money? They're going to either have to get a, you know, a, a, a bonus from the government or the insurance companies go bankrupt. So these kind of mandates are all over the place. And of course, the mandate that is really atrocious is the collection of about $400 billion worth of new taxes. And that, of course, is why they had to hire, or are planning to hire 16,500 more IRS agents. So it is a bad bill all the way around. And it will hasten the day of the bankruptcy of this country. And the American people will have to face that. So it would be a, a terrible way to uh, bring this to a head. But in, indeed, it will. It will put us in such financial shape that this country will have to decide do we want to live in a free country or do we want to live under totalitarianism and the point that you made about mandating and forcing people to buy something that they don't want and they maybe don't even need i think is a major step in the wrong direction do, do you think that it would actually come to the bankruptcy of the federal government well it's already bankrupt eh? an acknowledged bankruptcy of the federal government uh... before the people who run the congress today would recognize the, the economic lunacy of what the president signed into law yesterday. Stated differently, how bad would things have to get before even the Democrats realize that this thing has gone too far? Well, the countries go bankrupt differently than individuals or companies. They, they get bankrupt because the banks won't loan them any more money and they have to pay off the debt. Individuals have to take an extra job and cut spending. Governments and countries never do that. What they do is they uh, print money. 
And then when the dollar quits functioning, when you see the bond market crack, and there are some sli slight cracks in the bond market right now, interest rates are creeping up. Someday the bond market, the bond bubble will crash. That means interest rates will go up. Inflation will come, price inflation will come roaring back. We have the monetary inflation already. So it'll be the economics, uh, the, uh, econ the economic laws will declare this. The Congress won't all of a sudden, hey, hey, look, we have to do something. Because when Congress has a choice, there is no serious indication here in this government and unfortunately on both sides of the aisle when push comes to shove they're not willing to really really cut anything because if you talk about domestic welfare spending and foreign spending you know there are there's support for both of these uh, uh, types of expenditures so the the people here in the Congress aren't quite ready but hopefully the signs that we're seeing that the people are waking up uh, maybe we'll get some help here to do the right thing. Do, do you think, Congressman Paul, that there are many people in the Congress who crafted this legislation with the burdens that it imposes on insurance carriers? Like, you can't say no to anybody no matter what their pre-existing condition is. You can't say no even if they come to you after the onset of the pre-existing condition. You can't raise premiums to adjust for the pre-existing condition. Do you think that things like that in the bill were written in because there are people who voted for this who really want insurance companies to go out of business because they want us to have either the Canadian or, God forbid, the British model where there are no private contracts between individuals and insurance companies and the government is the sole payer, either as the employer of the health care entities or as the uh, persons or as the sole third party payer. Do you think that's what they want? I think so. I think there's a bunch of them that like that. I, I think that they may see this as chaos uh, coming, and this will give them a chance next go around to have one party payer, which is more total control of the government. So they knew they couldn't pass that right now, so they did back off. And this is once again what I've called tokenism. It's a major token this time, but it, we've been doing this for a long time. I mean, we've had uh, in the 1940s, the beginning of the government involvement in the Hill Burton episode, and and you know through the 50s and 60s, it's every decade we have more and more. And of course, even with the last administration, we had prescription drug programs. But so far, they haven't been able to totally overwhelm the corporations. Corporations have a lot to say about what's happening, whether it's a management company, the insurance company, the drug companies. Uh, they they have a lot to say about, and their lobbies are strong. So even though there's more mischief and more mandates and more controls. Uh, those individuals here in the Congress would like to see a single national health care system, and that's what they're working on. But let's, let's hope we wake up before that happens. Right. If, if, if this legislation accomplishes what the president and his folks say it will, then the 30 or 35 million Americans that don't have health insurance soon will. Where will the health care providers come from for those folks? And if you could think about this question as well. If you were back at Duke Medical School, would you have the same incentive to become a physician today that you did when you studied medicine? Well, I think I'd still have some of the same uh, incentives because uh, hopefully people will realize there's some of us who did go into medicine for the right reasons. But even with the incrementalism of the 60s, when I first started medicine, government wasn't that much involved. But I just refused to get engaged in that because I think what is most important is the doctor-patient relationship. But they, they claim there will be a lot of doctors drop out, and nobody knows how many will because, you know, they have to also think of, well, how am I going to make a living? He, they might have trained, and they have all this expense just to say, this is uh, disgusting, and drop out. They have a hard, that's a hard decision. But I would think the better people uh, may well not go in the medicine. I think the quality of the physician will certainly go down. Uh, and that the quality of medicine is obviously going to go down and, uh, and we will have more cost containments, more regulations, more rules. We will have rationing of care, which happens under all these systems. So I can't understand how anybody could be optimistic about the bill that has just been passed. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Congressman Paul, thanks for joining us on Freedom Watch. Thank you, Judge.